Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to The Well Told Tale. Every week we bring you the finest science fiction and fantasy stories ever written. The Well Told Tale is available as a podcast on YouTube and via our Patreon page, where there are additional stories exclusively for patrons. Please do check out the link in the description if you're interested in that. We return to the island of Dr Moreau by H.G. Wells. Our protagonist, Edward Prendick, has now seen some of this mysterious island. He has met Dr Moreau and heard the sound of his crazed experiments on animals and humans. Prendick now has no choice but to escape. But where to? He is alone on an island hundreds of miles from anywhere, with Moreau, his assistant Montgomery, and who knows how many strange beasts out there waiting for him. What will he do? It's time to pull up a chair, relax, and enjoy part three of The Island of Dr Moreau by H.G. Wells. Eleven. The Hunting of the Man. It came before my mind with an unreasonable hope of escape that the outer door of my room was still open to me. I was convinced now, absolutely assured, that Moreau had been vivisecting a human being. All the time since I had heard his name, I had been trying to link in my mind in some way the grotesque animalism of the islanders with his abominations, and now I thought I saw it all. The memory of his work on the transfusion of blood recurred to me. These creatures I had seen were the victims of some hideous experiment. These sickening scoundrels had merely intended to keep me back, to fool me with their display of confidence, and presently to fall upon me with a fate more horrible than death, with torture, and after torture the most hideous degradation it is possible to conceive, to send me off a lost soul, a beast, to the rest of their comus rout. I looked around for some weapon. Nothing. Then, with an inspiration, I turned over the deck chair, put my foot on the side of it, and tore away the side rail. It happened that a nail came away with the wood, and projecting gave a touch of danger to an otherwise petty weapon. I heard a step outside, and incontinently flung open the door and found Montgomery within a yard of it. He meant to lock the outer door. I raised this nailed stick of mine and cut at his face, but he sprang back. I hesitated a moment, then turned and fled round the corner of the house. Prendick, man! I heard his astonished cry. Don't be a silly ass, man! Another minute, thought I, and he would have had me locked in, and as ready as a hospital rabbit for my fate. He emerged behind the corner, for I heard him shout, Prendick! Then he began to run after me, shouting things as he ran. This time running blindly, I went northeastward in a direction at right angles to my previous expedition. Once, as I went running headlong up the beach, I glanced over my shoulder and saw his attendant with him. I ran furiously up the slope, over it, then turning eastwards along a rocky valley fringed on either side with jungle. I ran for perhaps a mile altogether, my chest straining, my heart beating in my ears, and then, hearing nothing of Montgomery or his man, and feeling upon the verge of exhaustion, I doubled sharply back towards the beach, as I judged, and lay down in the shelter of a canebrake. There I remained for a long time, too fearful to move, and indeed too fearful even to plan a course of action. The wild scene about me lay sleeping silently under the sun, and the only sound near me was the thin hum of some small gnat that had discovered me. Presently I became aware of a drowsy breathing sound, the soughing of the sea upon the beach. After about an hour, I heard Montgomery shouting my name far away to the north. That set me thinking of my plan of action. As I interpreted it then, this island was inhabited only by these two vivisectors and their animalised victims. Some of these, no doubt, they could press into their service against me if need arose, I knew both Moreau and Montgomery carried revolvers, and save for a feeble bar of deal spiked with a small nail, the merest mockery of a mace, I was unarmed. So I lay still there, until I began to think of food and drink, and at that thought the real hopelessness of my position came home to me. 
I knew no way of getting anything to eat. I was too ignorant of botany to discover any resort of root or fruit that might lie about me. I had no means of trapping the few rabbits upon the island. It grew blanker the more I turned the prospect over. At last, in the desperation of my position, my mind turned to the animal men I had encountered. I tried to find some hope in what I remembered of them. In turn, I recalled each one I had seen, and tried to draw some augury of assistance from my memory. Then suddenly, I heard a staghound bay, and at that realised a new danger. I took little time to think, or they would have caught me then, but snatching up my nailed stick, rushed headlong from my hiding place towards the sound of the sea. I remember a growth of thorny plants with spines that stabbed like penknives. I emerged bleeding and with torn clothes upon the lip of a long creek opening northward. I went straight into the water without a minute's hesitation, wading up the creek and presently finding myself knee-deep in a little stream. I scrambled out at last on the westward bank and, with my heart beating loudly in my ears, crept into a tangle of ferns to await the issue. I heard the dog, there was only one, draw nearer, and yelp when it came to the thorns, then I heard no more, and presently began to think I had escaped. The minutes passed, the silence lengthened out, and at last, after an hour of security, my courage began to return to me. By this time I was no longer very much terrified or very miserable. I had, as it were, passed the limit of terror and despair. I felt now that my life was practically lost, and that persuasion had made me capable of daring anything. I had even a certain wish to encounter Moreau face to face, and as I had waded into the water, I remembered that if I were too hard-pressed at least one path of escape from torment still lay open to me. They could not very well prevent my drowning myself. I had half a mind to drown myself then, but an odd wish to see the whole adventure out, a queer, impersonal, spectacular interest in myself, restrained me. I stretched my limbs, sore and painful from the pricks of the spiny plants, and stared around me at the trees, and so suddenly that it seemed to jump out of the green tracery about it, my eyes lit upon a black face watching me. I saw that it was the simian creature who had met the launch upon the beach. He was clinging to the oblique stem of a palm tree. I gripped my stick and stood up facing him. He began chattering. You, 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 was all I could distinguish at first. Suddenly he dropped from the tree, and in another moment was holding the fronds apart and staring curiously at me. I did not feel the same repugnance towards this creature which I had experienced in my encounters with the other beast-men. "'You,' he said, "'in the boat!' He was a man, then, at least as much of a man as Montgomery's attendant, for he could talk. "'Yes,' I said, "'I came in the boat from the ship.' "'Oh,' he said, and his bright, restless eyes travelled over me, to my hands, to the stick I carried, to my feet, to the tattered places in my coat— and the cuts and scratches I had received from the thorns. He seemed puzzled at something. His eyes came back to my hands. He held his own hand out and counted his digits slowly. One, two, three, four, five, eh? I did not grasp his meaning then. Afterwards I was to find that a great proportion of these beast people had malformed hands, lacking sometimes even three digits, but guessing this was in some way a greeting, I did the same thing by way of reply. He grinned with immense satisfaction. Then his swift roving glance went round again. He made a swift movement and vanished. The fern fronds he had stood between came swishing together. I pushed out of the brake after him, and was astonished to find him swinging cheerfully by one lank arm from a rope of creepers that looped down from the foliage overhead. His back was to me. Hello, said I. He came down with a twisting jump and stood facing me. "'I say,' said I, "'where can I get something to eat?' "'Eat,' he said. "'Eat man's food now.' And his eye went back to the swing of ropes. "'At the huts.' "'But where are the huts?' "'Oh, I'm new, you know.' At that he swung around and set off at a quick walk. All his motions were curiously rapid. "'Come along,' said he. I went with him to see the adventure out. 
I guessed their huts were some rough shelter where he and some more of these beast people lived. I might perhaps find them friendly, find some handle in their minds to take hold of. I did not know how far they had forgotten their human heritage. My ape-like companion trotted along by my side, with his hands hanging down and his jaw thrust forward. I wondered what memory he might have in him. "'How long have you been on this island?' said I. "'How long?' he asked, and after having the question repeated, he held up three fingers. The creature was little better than an idiot. I tried to make out what he meant by that, and it seemed I bored him. After another question or two, he suddenly left my side and went leaping at some fruit that hung from a tree. He pulled down a handful of prickly husks and went on eating the contents. I noted this with satisfaction, for here at least was a hint for feeding. I tried him with some other question, but his chattering, prompt responses were as often as not quite at cross-purposes with my question. Some few were appropriate, others quite parrot-like. I was so intent upon these peculiarities that I scarcely noticed the path we were following. Presently we came to trees, all charred and brown, and so to a bare place covered with a yellow-white incrustation, across which a drifting smoke, pungent in whiffs to nose and eyes, went drifting. On our right, over a shoulder of bare rock, I saw the level blue of the sea. The path coiled down abruptly into a narrow ravine between two tumbled and knotty masses of blackish scoriae. Into this we plunged. It was extremely dark, this passage, after the blinding sunlight reflected from the sulphurous ground. Its walls grew steep and approached each other. Blotches of green and crimson drifted across my eyes. My conductor stopped suddenly. Home, said he, and I stood in a floor of a chasm that was at first absolutely dark to me. I heard some strange noises and thrust the knuckles of my left hand into my eyes. I became aware of a disagreeable odour, like that of a monkey's cage ill-cleaned. Beyond, the rock opened again upon a gradual slope of sunlit greenery, and on either hand the light smote down through the narrow ways into the central gloom. 12. The Sayers of the Law then something cold touched my hand. I started violently, and saw close to me a dim pinkish thing. It looked more like a flayed child than anything else in the world. The creature had exactly the mild but repulsive features of a sloth, the same low forehead and slow gestures. As the first shock of the change of light passed, I saw about me more distinctly. The little sloth-like creature was standing and staring at me. My conductor had vanished. The place was a narrow passage between high walls of lava, a crack in the knotted rock, and on either side interwoven heaps of sea mat, palm fans, and reeds leaning against the rock-formed rough and impenetrably dark dens. The winding way up the ravine between these was scarcely three yards wide, and was disfigured by lumps of decaying fruit pulp and other refuse, which accounted for the disagreeable stench of the place. The little pink sloth creature was still blinking at me when my ape-man reappeared at the aperture of the nearest of these dens and beckoned me in. As he did so, a slouching monster wriggled out of one of the places further up this strange street, and stood in featureless silhouette against the bright green beyond, staring at me. I hesitated, having half a mind to bolt the way I had come, and then, determined to go through with the adventure, I gripped my nailed stick about the middle and crawled into the little evil-smelling lean-to after my conductor. It was a semicircular space, shaped like the half of a beehive, and against the rocky wall that formed the inner side of it was a pile of variegated fruits, coconuts among other things. Some rough vessels of lava and wood stood about the floor, and one on a rough stool. There was no fire. In the darkest corner of the hut sat a shapeless mass of darkness that grunted, Hey! as I came in and my ape-man stood in the dim light of the doorway and held out a split coconut to me as I crawled into the other corner and squatted down. I took it and began gnawing it as serenely as possible, in spite of a certain trepidation and the nearly intolerable closeness of the den. The little pink sloth creature stood in the aperture of the hut, and something else with a drab face and bright eyes came staring over its shoulder. "'Hey!' came the lump of mystery opposite. "'It is a man!' 
gabbled my conductor. A man, a man, a five man, like me. Shut up, said the voice from the dark, and grunted. I gnawed my coconut amid an impressive stillness. I peered hard into the blackness, but could distinguish nothing. It is a man, the voice repeated. He comes to live with us? It was a thick voice, with something in it, a kind of whistling overtone that struck me as peculiar, but the English accent was strangely good. The ape-man looked at me as though he expected something. I perceived the pause was interrogative. He comes to live with you, I said. It is a man. He must learn the law. I began to distinguish now a deeper blackness in the black, a vague outline of a hunched-up figure. Then I noticed the opening of the place was darkened by two more black heads. My hand tightened on my stick. The thing in the dark repeated in a louder tone, Say the words. I had missed its last remark. Not to go on all fours, that is the law. It repeated in a kind of sing-song. I was puzzled. Say the words, said the ape-man repeating and the figures in the doorway echoed this with a threat in their tone of voices. I realised that I had to repeat this idiotic formula, and then began the insanest ceremony. The voice in the dark began intoning a mad litany, line by line, and I and the rest to repeat it. As they did so, they swayed from side to side in the oddest way, and beat their hands upon their knees, and I followed their example. I could have imagined that I was already dead and in another world. That dark hut, these grotesque dim figures just flecked here and there by a glimmer of light, and all of them swaying in unison and chanting, Not to go on all fours, that is the law, are we not men? Not to suck up drink, that is the law, are we not men? Not to eat fish or flesh, that is the law. Are we not men? Not to claw the bark of trees, that is the law. Are we not men? Not to chase other men, that is the law. Are we not men? And so, from the prohibition of these acts of folly, on to the prohibition of what I thought then were the maddest, most impossible, and most indecent things one could well imagine. A kind of rhythmic fervour fell on all of us. We gabbled and swayed faster and faster, repeating this amazing law. Superficially, the contagion of these brutes was upon me, but deep down within me, the laughter and disgust struggled together. We ran through a long list of prohibitions, and then the chance swung around to a new formula. His is the house of pain. His is the hand that makes. His is the hand that wounds. His is the hand that heals. And so on for another long series, mostly quite incomprehensible gibberish to me about him, whoever he might be. I could have fancied it was a dream, but never before have I heard chanting in a dream. His is the lightning flash, we sang. His is the deep salt sea. A horrible fancy came into my head that Moreau, after animalising these men, had infected their dwarfed brains with a kind of deification of himself. However, I was too keenly aware of white teeth and strong claws about me to stop my chanting on that account. His are the stars in the sky. At last that song ended. I saw the ape-man's face shining with perspiration, and my eyes being now accustomed to the darkness, I saw more distinctly the figure in the corner from which the voice came. It was the size of a man, but it seemed covered with a dull grey hair, almost like a sky terrier. What was it? What were they all? He is a five-man, a five-man, a five-man, like me, said the ape-man. I held out my hands. The grey creature in the corner leant forward. Not to run on all fours, that is the law, are we not men? he said. He put out a strangely distorted talon and gripped my fingers. The thing was almost like the hoof of a deer produced into claws. I could have yelled with surprise and pain. His face came forward and peered at my nails, came forward into the light of the opening of the hut, and I saw with a quivering disgust that it was like the face of neither man nor beast, 
but a mere shock of grey hair, with three shadowy overarchings to mark the eyes and mouth. "'He has little nails,' said this grisly creature into his hairy beard. "'It is well.' He threw my hand down, and instinctively I gripped my stick. "'Eat roots and herbs. It is his will,' said the ape-man. "'I am the sayer of the law,' said the grey figure. "'Here come all that be new to learn the law. "'I sit in the darkness and say the law.' "'It is even so,' said one of the beasts in the doorway. "'Evil are the punishments of those who break the law. "'None escape.' "'None escape,' said the beast-folk, glancing furtively at one another. "'None!' "'None!' said the ape-man. "'None escape! See, I did a little thing, a wrong thing, once. I jabbered, 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 stop talking. None could understand. I am burnt, branded in the hand. He is great. He is good. None escape. "'None escape!' said the grey creature in the corner. "'None escape!' said the beast-people, looking askance at one another. "'For every one the want that is bad,' said the grey sayer of the law. "'What you will want we do not know. We shall know. "'Some want to follow things that move, to watch and slink and wait and spring, "'to kill and bite, bite deep and rich, sucking the blood. It is bad. "'Not to chase other men, that is the law. Are we not men?' Not to eat flesh or fish, that is the law. Are we not men? None escape. None escape, said a dappled brute standing in the doorway. For every one the want is bad, said the grey sayer of the law. Some want to go tearing with teeth and hands into the roots of things, snuffling into the earth. It is bad. None escape, said the men in the door. Some go clawing trees, some go scratching at the graves of the dead, some go fighting with foreheads or feet or claws, some bite suddenly, none giving occasion, some love uncleanness. None escape, said the ape man, scratching his calf. None escape, said the little pink sloth creature. "'Punishment is sharp and sure, therefore learn the law. Say the words!' And incontinently he began again the strange litany of the law, and again I and all these creatures began singing and swaying. My head reeled with this jabbering and the close stench of the place, but I kept on, trusting to find presently some chance of a new development. "'Not to go on all fours, that is the law. Are we not men?' We were making such a noise that I noticed something of a tumult outside, until someone, who I think was one of the two swine men I had seen, thrust his head over the little pink sloth creature and shouted something excitedly, something that I did not catch. Incontinently, those at the opening of the hut vanished. My ape-man rushed out. The thing that had sat in the dark followed him. I observed only that it was big and clumsy and covered with silvery hair, and I was left alone. Then, before I reached the aperture, I heard the yelp of a staghound. In another moment, I was standing outside the hovel, my chair rail in my hand, every muscle of me quivering. Before me were the clumsy backs of perhaps a score of these beast people, their misshapen heads half hidden by their shoulder blades. They were gesticulating excitedly. Other half-animal faces glared interrogation out of the hovels. Looking in the direction in which they faced, I saw coming through the haze under the trees, beyond the end of the passage of dens, the dark figure and awful white face of Moreau. He was holding the leaping staghound back, and close behind him came Montgomery, revolver in hand. For a moment I stood, horror-struck. I turned and saw the passage behind me blocked by another heavy brute, with a huge grey face and twinkling little eyes advancing towards me. I looked round and saw to the right of me, and half a dozen yards in front of me, a narrow gap in the wall of rock through which a ray of light slanted into the shadows. Stop! cried Moreau as I strode towards this, and then, Hold him! At that, first one face turned toward me, and then others. Their bestial minds were happily slow. 
I dashed my shoulder into a clumsy monster who was turning to see what Moreau meant and flung him forward into another. I felt his hands fly around, clutching at me and missed me. The little pink sloth creature dashed at me, and I gashed down its ugly face with the nail in my stick, and in another minute was scrambling up a steep side pathway, a kind of sloping chimney, out of the ravine. I heard a howl behind me, and cries of, "'Catch him! Hold him!' and the grey-faced creature appeared behind me and jammed his huge bulk into the cleft. "'Go on! Go on!' they howled. I clambered up the narrow cleft of the rock and came out upon the sulphur on the western side of the village of the Beastmen. That gap was altogether fortunate for me, for the narrow chimney slanting obliquely upward must have impeded their nearer pursuers. I ran over the white space and down a steep slope through a scattered growth of trees and came to a low-lying stretch of tall reeds through which I pushed into a dark, thick undergrowth that was black and succulent underfoot. As I plunged into the reeds, my foremost pursuers emerged from the gap. I broke my way through this undergrowth for some minutes. The air behind me and about me was soon full of threatening cries. I heard the tumult of my pursuers in the gap up the slope, then the crashing of the reeds, and every now and then the crackling crash of a branch. Some of the creatures roared like excited beasts of prey. The staghound yelped to the left. I heard Moreau and Montgomery shouting in the same direction. I turned sharply to the right. It seemed to me even then that I heard Montgomery shouting for me to run for my life. Presently the ground gave rich and oozy under my feet, but I was desperate and went headlong into it, struggling through knee-deep and so came to a winding path among tall canes. The noise of my pursuers passed away to my left. In one place, three strange pink hopping animals, about the size of cats, bolted before my footsteps. This pathway ran up a hill, across another open space covered with white incrustation, and plunged into a cane break again. Then suddenly it turned parallel with the edge of a steep-walled gap which came without warning, like the ha-ha of an English park, turned with an unexpected abruptness. I was still running with all my might, and I never saw this drop until I was flying headlong through the air. I fell on my forearms and head among thorns, and rose with a torn ear and bleeding face. I had fallen into a precipitous ravine, rocky and thorny, full of a hazy mist which drifted about me in wisps, and with a narrow streamlet from which this mist came meandering down the centre. I was astonished at this thin fog in the full blaze of daylight, but I had no time to stand wondering then, hoping to come to the sea in that direction, and so have my way open to drown myself. It was only later I found that I had dropped my nailed stick in my fall. Presently the ravine grew narrower for a space, and carelessly I stepped into the stream. I jumped out again pretty quickly, for the water was almost boiling. I noticed, too, there was a thin, sulphurous scum drifting along its coiling water. Almost immediately came a turn in the ravine and the indistinct blue horizon. The nearer sea was flashing the sun from a myriad facets. I saw my death before me, but I was hot and panting, with the warm blood oozing out on my face and running pleasantly through my veins. I felt more than a touch of exultation, too, at having distanced my pursuers. It was not in me then to go out and drown myself yet. I stared back the way I had come. I listened. Save for the hum of the gnats and the chirp of some small insects that hopped along the thorns, the air was absolutely still. Then came the yelp of a dog, very faint, and a chattering and gibbering, the snap of a whip, and voices. They grew louder, then fainter again. The noise receded up the stream and faded away. For a while, the chase was over, but I knew now how much hope of help for me lay in the beast people. And welcome back. I hope you enjoyed part three of The Island of Dr Moreau by H.G. Wells. I release many of the stories I narrate here as self-contained audiobooks. Alice in Wonderland, The Call of Cthulhu and more are available from thewelltoldtale.net if you're interested in that. Or head over to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash thewelltoldtale if you want more classic stories. There are links to both in the description. I'll be back next week with part four of The Island of Dr Moreau. I hope you can join me.